uh, forerunner school class, a theology of the bride. And uh, for those that uh, weren't here last week, we um, we decided to do. I mean, a lot of the forerunner school teachings we do uh, into kind of do an empty room and just do them a recording during the week. But Brian and I both felt like the, this. There's five messages that that we need to do here live on Sunday mornings uh, in front of our local congregation uh, because they're so significant uh, to those, especially to those who are called as forerunners, especially to those called as forerunners. These are these five messages are critical that we get a real grasp of them and understand them and be able to be a voice. Uh, well beyond the walls of this building, uh, wherever the Lord may lead us, whether it's just in your office or to a neighbor or whether you have a platform ministry or, or whatever the Lord may open up to you, uh, forerunners need to be a voice. And these five messages that we're in the midst of right now are critical because they give us an understanding of what the scriptures say about the bride of Christ and the bride making herself ready. Again, the class we're in is a theology of the bride. Um, and so in, in this session, our last session, we started with uh, a, an understanding of the bride in the book of Revelation. That's, that's probably the most extensive place where the bride is discussed is in the book of Revelation. So we dealt with that in the last session. And for those that have not been able to watch that or you haven't uh, listened to it or read the notes, uh, you really need to go back and, and do that session because it sets a foundation really for the next two and for many others really. Uh, we're, in that session, we dealt with Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation uh, chapter 3. And so it's a critical, um, critical set of scriptures related to us as a bride to be made ready. It's very important that we get a real grasp of that. So that was last week. And then this week we're going to deal, continue, we're going to just moving progressively through the, the book of Revelation as it relates to bridal preparation. Uh, and this week we're going to look at two, uh, we've got some other things first, but we're going to ultimately get to two passages of scripture. We're going to look at Revelation 12, uh, and we'll touch on 13 and 14, but basically Revelation chapter 12. Uh, and then we're going to also look at Revelation chapter 19, 7 through 9, where the bride has made herself ready. We're going to look at those two passages, really key passages, and uh, really want to encourage um, those of you that feel like you're called as forerunners uh, to really dig in to both of those passages and get understanding of those both of those passages there. Uh, crucial uh, to our understanding uh, of the bride being made ready and, and to our call as forerunners. Now, if you read the note, I want to, if you're called to the forerunner, I really want to encourage you to read the notes because there's a lot of uh, Greek words and, uh, and common, this commentator said this and this one said that. And if I, if I preach all that, you will be more asleep than you are right now. So I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to get into that. I may get a little bit into Greek words, but not much. But there's a lot of real insight in all of that. But you need to go to the notes to do that. It'll be posted online uh, with this. So I really want to encourage you to do that. So anyway, that's where we're headed with this session. We're going to, I want to do a little bit of review. And then I want to uh, just kind of lay out to me the way the book of Revelation is laid out in terms of preparation uh, and then we'll dig into those, uh, those two uh, passages of Scripture. So let's do a little bit of review. Remember, this is important. Remember in the, in the last session, uh, we talked about five different views of the bride and then four different views of who an overcomer is. And both, both of those are really important to understand if we're going to be for, forerunners. So just really, really quickly, the five views of the bride, if I can remember them here offhand, the first one is there really is no bride. Uh, that it's just a way of expressing a certain character trait of the church. Uh, and there are a lot of people who hold that view, that there really is no bride. Uh, the second view is that there is a bride, but that every born-again believer 
uh, is the bride made ready. There's no distinction. If you're born again, you are, uh, the, you are the bride made ready. Uh, the third one is that, there, that the bride is not the church at all, but is Israel. Uh, that Israel is the bride, but the church is not the bride. And you have to go back to the notes from last week and all to, uh, to, to get more information on that. The fourth view is that the bride does need to make herself ready. However, God's going to do a sovereign work of uh, revival and in the pressures of the end times, and that in itself will make the bride ready. Now, th that one definitely has some truth in it, for sure, that when God pours out his spirit, which we do believe will happen as part of the, some of the end time pressures and the pressures of the, of the end times, that that will produce a lot of bridal preparation in the body of Christ, and it will in part, make the bride ready. But that view in and of itself says that, you, you know, there's really nothing you need to do individually as a radical pursuit of bridal preparation, uh, and that would be wrong. And then the, the fifth view, which is the view we hold to, is that the bride, the eternal wife of the Lamb, is, a, is an eternal reward granted to those who make themselves ready, granted at the judgment seat of Christ, and the ones that receive that will be the bride made ready, the eternal wife of Christ, and rule and reign with him in intimacy and authority throughout the ages. So that's the, the view that we hold, and that's the, what we're supporting with this. So now, one more review. The overcomers. You know, we talked about different views of, of, the, of the overcomers, and... This is important, too, because the book of Revelation deals with overcoming, and we're going to deal with it uh, in Revelation. We deal with Revelation 12. We'll deal with it as well. You really need to grasp these things. Uh, one view is that every believer is an overcomer, that if you're born again, that you're, you're automatically an overcomer. Uh, and you would be amazed at how many of the commentators hold that view. Probably pretty much everyone, well, not everyone, but a lot of them, hold that view that if you're born again, you're an overcomer. So all it is, all you need to do is be born again and then you're automatically an overcomer. All the promises of, of Revelation chapter 2 and 3 are yours just because you're born again. And so the thief on the cross uh, would receive, under this view, would receive the same eternal rewards uh, as the Apostle Paul. Uh, and so obviously we don't believe that view, but that is a common view of the overcomer. Another view is the perseverance of the saints. And so you don't really have to, in this view, you don't really have to overcome uh, the specific things that are listed in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. In other words, you don't have to overcome Jezebel. You don't have to overcome the lack of first love. You don't have to overcome lukewarmness. If you just hang in there and don't deny Christ and just keep going, even in the midst of, of struggles and trials and tribulations, you are an overcomer. Again, that is another uh, fairly common view. Uh, and so, again, we don't believe that view either. Loss of salvation is the third view, that if you don't overcome, if you don't overcome, you lose your salvation. Uh, and there are people who hold that view. Uh, and so, in other words, the, the church at Ephesus, they lost their first love. And so, if they did not regain it, under this view, if they did not regain it, they would lose their salvation. Uh, and there are a fair number of people who hold that view. Again, we don't believe that view either. But here's what our view is, the eternal rewards view of the overcomer. And that is this, that there are specific issues that God has called us to overcome. Uh, in, in the book of Revelation and in the Apostle John's writings, uh, he uses that word overcome. Uh, and in Revelation, there, there are specific things that God says, I have this against you, and I want you to overcome this issue. You know, lukewarmness, uh, not dining with Christ, uh, Jezebel, being asleep, not clothing yourself in bridal garments. You, know, the, you go through the different seven messages, and there, and there, uh, there are many of those. Uh, and so... The, the eternal rewards view is that we have to over, we're, we're challenged and invited to overcome each of those issues, each of those things. Uh, and we have to be led of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will bring up these issues in our lives from time to time. And so when he brings them up, we have to deal with them. 
And we have to, by the grace of God we, and by his divine power within us, we have to draw upon that grace and that from that, we have to deal with that and overcome it uh, by God's power. We have to overcome those things. And as we do that, uh, we will get the rewards associated with overcoming those specific issues. And like we said last week, uh, last time, a lot of those are bridal in nature. Not all, not all the promises of Revelation 2 and 3 are bridal, but several of them are bridal to, for, to be the bride uh, made ready. Uh, so anyway, that's a little bit of, of the review. One more point of review that I want to make before we jump in because it's important that we understand this. Uh, and this will be really important in this message as we get in more and more into it. Uh, the, the Jewish wedding pattern uh, is that, that has been applied to us as believers. The Jewish wedding pattern was that there was a, a, a couple would have an arranged marriage. They would have a betrothal ceremony. The groom would go to the, his father's house to add a room to his house and the bride would make herself ready. And then there would be a year later or so a wedding ceremony and a marriage supper that would be a part of that. And then they would live together. That's the Jewish pattern. Now, the Lord has brought that pattern into our relationship with Christ. When we are born again, we are betrothed as Christ's bride and, and we are referred to at, at that point as his bride. And we have our life or the church age to make ourselves ready. And then there will be a uh, consummation at the second coming of Christ, a consummation ceremony at some point related to the con second coming of Christ. The marriage supper of the Lamb will take place and the bride made ready will be in unity and union with, with Christ from that point forth. And, and so that's the overview of the pattern uh, that we believe the scriptures teach and these scripture verses fall in uh, to that pattern. Now, it's a lot of review, and I hope I haven't put you to sleep with it. So, but now I want to, before we get into the scriptures, I want to, I want to flow a little bit through the book of Revelation to understand how Revelation 2 and 3 fit in to this overall book, because this is going to be important when we start discussing Revelation 12 and Revelation 19. Um, and I wasn't going to do this, but I, pre I started meditating this morning in preparation on Revelation chapter 1. And there's so, it's so much powerful. And, and it's, a, it's amazing that the worship team really sang a lot of the concepts uh, that are in Revelation chapter 1 today. So I want to just read, not the whole, I won't read it word for word, but you really ought to read this. But this is, what, this is how the Lord started uh, the book of Revelation. Uh, and it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave us to show to his bondservants the things which are going to take place. And he sent and communicated them by an angel to John, uh, who testified of the word. And then verse 3, this is a, a, a critical verse. He said, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it for the time is near. Now, that's, it is so true right now. The time is near. And we need, to, we need to be familiar with these words. But more than anything, this is a word for a lot of us, all of us really. We need to heed the words in this book. There's a lot of words in here that need to be heeded. Now, you know, there's going to be an earthquake that's going to shake the world. I mean, you know, I don't know how we heed that really. But there's a lot of words in Revelation 2 and 3, Revelation 12, Revelation 19, and other places that need to be heeded by the body of Christ to be made ready, to be prepared for what is coming. Not only to be made ready as a bride made ready, but to be able to stand in the pressures that come, or are coming in the earth. And they're frightening. The more you, more you hear about and read about uh, and watch videos about the things that are being planned by the kings of the earth, uh, you know, it's, fright it's a frightening thing. We need to be made ready. Amen. Amen. So let's go on in chapter 1. 
And John to the seven churches, this is verse 4, John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before the throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead. Oh, and I like this one. This phrase here has been just a joy to me uh, since I began to do this study on Revelation. He is the firstborn of the dead, and he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. Hallelujah. The ruler of the kings of the earth. You know, the elite of the earth may think that they're ruling the earth, but Jesus is in heaven, Psalm 2. Jesus is in heaven laughing because he, he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. Now, that's important uh, as important truth to know as we get into the call to stand and to be prepared. And that's what he's starting the book. He said, look, he, he said, things are going to happen. Things are coming. Get ready for it. But I, Jesus, I said, I rule the kings of the earth. I am the king of heaven and earth. Amen, 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 amen. And to him, for to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. And behold, he is coming in the clouds and every eye will see him. Those will pierce him and the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it, so it is to be. Amen. It is to be. So it is to be. He will come back on the clouds. And we'll deal with that in session five, which will be a couple weeks from now. We'll deal with, we'll, we'll deal with that. Uh, and that's, to me, that's really exciting, the, the grand processional uh, coming on a white horse and we as a, his armies will be riding with him on white horses, dressed in fine linen, uh, just celebrating while he executes his judgment on the kings of the earth. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Um, and then he said, Verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, who was and is and who is to come, the Almighty. Now, I want to read this. Uh, I think it's, yeah, here, verse 6. Let me read verse 6 again. And he has made us to be a kingdom priest to his God and Father. Okay, now, we need to listen to this, okay? Some translations say kings and priests, and I'm not sure if this means that or not, but we, I, th I think we are called to be kings and priests. We are called to be, here, I want to focus on priests for a minute. We are called, at the beginning of the book of Revelation, we are invited to be a priest unto God. But when we get to Revelation 19, 7, we'll, and we'll deal with this in detail when we get there, the bride has made herself ready and she is clothed in fine linen. That is the garment of the priest. So we're called to be priests, but we've got to be, we've got to be prepared to be made ready so that we get these priestly garments so that we can go into the presence of God, presence of Christ eternally. There's a real call to be made ready, to be prepared. And so anyway, but going back to the overview, the survey of the book of Revelation, he, Jesus starts it out declaring his sovereignty and his intentions over his body. He said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning of the end. I am the ruler of the kings of the earth. I am in control. Amen. So that's good to know when everything gets, starts falling apart, isn't it? That Jesus is in control of everything. Now I'm going to skip two and three now for a minute. Then he goes four and five, chapters four and five. He gives us a vision, the, probably the biggest, greatest vision of heaven in the New Testament. He gives us a vision of the, of the authority and the, the, the beauty and glory of heaven. And then through six through 18, chapter six through 18, he talks about what all is going to happen in the end times. You know, the, the, there are other things in between there, but, the, you know, the overall theme is a lot of the judgments and the clash of the kingdoms between the kings of the earth and between 
that and Christ himself and his armies and all of that. So we see all the bad things that are going to happen in 6 through 18. And then in uh, 19, but he says the bride's going to make herself ready and starting with verse 11, the heavens are going to open up. I'm going to come back riding on a white horse with my armies, both angels and the bride made ready because the, the people will be dressed in fine linen, clean, white and clean, it says in 14, I believe, 1914. Then 21 and 22, he talks about the eternal destiny, the millennial kingdom and the, in the eternal ages where the bride has come, comes down made ready. So what is he doing? He said, first at the beginning, he said, I'm in control. All stuff is going to break out. But here's the destiny I have for you. Yeah. But then here, here's why Revelation 2 and 3 is so important. He said, okay, all this is going to happen. I'm in control, yes. But Revelation 2 and 3, you need to make yourself ready. You need, you need to do, you need to heed these things. Now, that's not the only places he says heed, but, that, but this is two chapters where he says heed. In other words, if you want to, because a lot of the a lot of the promises and the challenges are don't fall away, you know, be faithful unto death, you know. I mean that doesn't that doesn't bless you too much to hear it, but um, it's but it's important. He said, be faithful unto death, because look, I've got all this, I've got this destiny for you, and I'm in control. He said, okay, overcome Jezebel. Because I want to give you authority in the nations. Overcome lukewarmness. Because I want you to sit with me on my throne. I want to dine with you. You see, so he's so these promises, some of them are to stand in the pressures of the end times. Some of them are to be made ready as a bride so that you can have the, the, the best place in eternity seated with Christ on his throne. And so he's saying to his church, be made ready, be made ready, be made ready. It's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it. Uh, now, I'm sure that was an encouraging word to John when he was on the island of Patmos. You know, Domitian was the Roman uh, emperor at that point in time. And he was not a nice guy. And John had been exiled to Patmos. And I don't think that was a very fun place. There was no five-star hotel there. And it's probably a work camp, you know. And the king of the earth there, Domitian, probably wasn't on his list of favorite people. But to hear that, it's like, it's going to be all right. I can make it. It's a challenge to make it. And so we, and we don't face the mission, but we fa we're facing some things that are really uncertain right now. I mean, we know, I mean, right now, the issues that we're literally facing at the moment are disgusting things in a lot of ways, but they're not, a, they're not really affecting us in terms of being able to buy, sell, you know, live. But there's a lot of stuff bubbling up in the world. And so there's a challenge to us all. Heed these things. Because he said, he gives this promise to the church at Philadelphia, Revelation 3. He says, okay, I'm, he didn't have anything against them. He said, you've kept my word and you did not, you did not deny my name. And I'm going to keep you from the hour of testing that is coming upon the whole earth. See, I believe, I believe whatever, I, I mean, you know, I would love to be wrong on this, but I believe that there is an hour of real testing coming upon the earth in our lifetime in the, in, in, right over the horizon. And I want him to protect me from that. Now, whether that's rapture or protection or Goshen type of thing or whatever, I don't know for sure, and, I, and I'm not, that's not the point at this point in time. Be made ready. Become the church at Philadelphia. 
to, st to stand, to survive, plus also to be made ready uh, so that you can be in the, prepared with garments that allow you to go into the most intimate places with Christ and to rule with him forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. Amen. Okay, so let's look at, let's look for next at Revelation chapter 12. Here's Revelation chapter 12. I want, I want to read the first uh, five verses, the first five or six verses here. Um, and you're familiar with it, but I want to, I want to read it anyway. Uh, a great sign appeared in heaven, and a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. And she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. And, and then it talks about uh, the dragon and, and that. But then, uh, verse, we'll skip down to verse 5. And then she gave birth to a son. The New American Standard says a male child. The King James says a man child. Who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Uh, now, let me just talk about this man child. You know, I mean, if you read most of the commenta commentators... They're going to say that the man-child is Christ uh, at his birth, and it refers back to 2,000 years ago. Uh, now, I, this, the point of this message is not to try to defend our position against that. But our view, and I, and I think supported, is that the man-child not, does not refer in this situation to Christ as being... Uh, born 2,000 years ago and being caught up to heaven at his resurrection. Uh, it refers to a people who have been made ready as the first fruits uh, for Christ. And we see that in Revelation 14, that this man-child is, is, is also a first fruits for Christ because they've been obedient and they followed him wherever he went. And you can read that in Revelation 14. At a different time, but this this is the the man child, which is the which is those who have overcome throughout history, but also who are alive now and who will be alive at the time of his coming. It's to to though the man child is the mature son, uh, the, which is a mature son for the heavenly Father. And also a bride made ready for Christ according to God's eternal purpose. And this is an important verse of scripture because what happens here is when this man child is made ready, you see very, the very next chapter that, the, well in that chapter, the dragon is cast to earth, the coming forth of the man child in maturity uh, causes the dragon to be cast to earth. And when the dragon is, and, his, and his demons are cast to earth, the very next chapter, the beast rises from the sea. The Antichrist rises up. And it says in this passage, this is at the midpoint of the tribulation period. Three and a half years into the tribulation period, whatever the number, however it works out, the man-child will be made ready. The dragon will be cast to the earth and the uh, and when the dragon uh, is cast to the earth, the uh, Antichrist will arise in that last three and a half years. And then 14, uh, however that works out, it talks about this first fruits harvest that came, which is the man, I, we believe, is the man child, the harvest of the man child company. Uh, so it's a really key verse of scripture. And However it works out, I want to be a part of the man-child company. Yes. Uh, give me an amen if you want to be a part of the man-child company. Whatever it is, I want to be, I want to be a part of it. Uh, okay. Well, here's, what, here's how we do it. Uh, verse 11. And they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony and they did not love their life 
even unto death or when faced with death. Now let's, talk, let's deal, let's understand that scripture. I think this will be important that we understand it. I'm going to deal with this kind of word by word. They, they. Okay, who is they report, re referring to? Um, now, if you read the commentators in the, in the uh, comment, uh, commentaries, most of them will say this, that this is a proleptic term. <laughs> I love that, proleptic. <laughs> I, who, who, knew what, who knows what proleptic means? Uh, I, you do, okay. Uh, Brian, Brian's like the study nerd. <laughs> yeah, I did not know what it meant. Even after reading the commentary, I had to look it up in the uh, I looked up in the dictionary. But anyway, what it means is that it really, even though it was they overcame, this really actually refers to overcame in the past tense. Because it's talking about that in the past tense. It's really not referring to the past tense. It's referring to something that's going to happen in the future, but they know it's going to happen, so they call it the past tense. I thought, okay, I don't believe that. <laughs> they, it, but, and the reason they have to do that is because they, Revelation, I mean, yeah, Revelation 12, 1 through 5, they say, that, okay, this refers to Jesus. So because it refers to Jesus, and not the mature man-child, they can't refer to the man-child because they don't believe in the man-child. So they have to kind of manipulate all that to come up with something that it doesn't really apply to. But the they is the man-child. That the man-child company, they, and what did they do? By, by the time of Revelation 12, what did they do? They overcame. They overcame. Now, we're going to get to this a little bit more in a few minutes, but Revelation 2 and 3, the invitation to overcome. Revelation 12, they overcame. Past tense. You know, they were given the invitation to overcome, to heed these words. And this man-child company took it seriously. And they dealt with it all throughout their life. And they overcame. And so, because they overcame, they were part of the first fruits harvest, whatever that means. So, I think we know enough now to say definitely, I want to be a part of that man-child company. I want, to be, I want to be made ready there. I want to overcome to be made ready. So who do they overcome? They overcame the dragon, him. They overcame him, the dragon, and all of his ways and all of his seductions and all of his plots and plans and strategies and accusations and all the different things. They overcame. They overcame him. Now, how did they do it? This is important to, to see how they, still in 12, 11, how they overcome. They overcame him because, first because of the blood of the lamb. Because Jesus at the cross defeated every way of the enemy. He defeated that. You see that in Colossians chapter 2, where the, the whole, most of the chapter talks about uh, Jesus at the cross. He nailed our certificate of debt uh, to the cross. Uh, he disarmed, this is the important part I guess here, he disarmed every ruler, every authority, every principality. Now, they're not out of the way as we, you know, as we know, you know, preterists think that Satan's been bound and I said, okay, who knew? Who knew? <laughs> yeah. But he's been disarmed. He's not been bound or to where he has no effect on our life, but he's been disarmed. So that the Jesus' blood is, has disarmed him. And that's the way we overcome. Because by the blood of the Lamb, he disarmed every ruler, principality, and every demonic spirit and 
what Brian's class is going to teach us after we finish this one, his grace abides within us to battle every issue that we face so that we can win the victory. I mean, I and you, we cannot defeat Satan. But the, but the Holy Spirit within us can if we cooperate with him. Yeah. And so the blood of the lamb is absolutely essential and we have to appropriate his blood to be an overcomer, but we have to participate in it. We have to participate in it. And that's where we get to the next phrase. By the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. Because of the word of their testimony. Now, this is what I believe, and actually, uh, my favorite of the commentators, uh, Robert Thomas, agrees with me on this point. One of the few that he, but no, he's, he really does a great job in his commentary. He says, and I don't have the word exactly, it's in the notes, I quoted it in the notes, but he says that that phrase yields to the sensing of our life uh, exhibiting the victory over that particular issue. I'm using my own terminology there. But basically what he's saying, the word of our testimony, is that those issues listed in Revelation 2 and 3, uh, that the man-child overcame them, and there's a testimony in his life that he has overcome, has overcome them. That's the word of his testimony. There's a, the, you know, that people see it, or maybe they don't see it, but the Lord sees it and sees that they have overcome it and there's a te- he has a testimony in his life that he has overcome that. And that's how we get the word of the testimony. It's overcoming. Again, going back to Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 where he gives us these invitations to overcome all this. And so the, the man-child has been successful. He has overcome those things. Now, I don't think he's looking for perfection. Otherwise, I don't know anybody on the earth uh, there. But there's been a significant testimony and maturity there to overcome. And then, so now, let's look at the third part. And they overcame by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life unto death, or even faced with death. Now, what does that mean? That means, uh, and that word uh, life there is uh, uh, suke, their soul life. But it's, it's, it refers actually to actual physical life and soul life. So first, they didn't love their soul life. They didn't learn their, love their self life. You know, they were willing to let their self-life die. And that's kind of, that's where most of the church is right now. The Lord is challenging us in our self-life. You know, he says, okay, you love this and you love this and you love that. And these things are not consistent with you being an overcomer. So you have to die to those things, your self-life. So that's where we are now. But... I believe, again, I hope I'm wrong, but I believe we're on the verge of days ahead where our physical life is going to be on the line. Now, you know, I I hope I'm wrong on that. Um, But, you know, you just, I mean, you just look at you know, you, you look at what's going on in the world. I mean, in, in, in nations that we would have never thought would happen. Like, let's just say Australia, for example. Well, who would have ever thought Australia would deal with COVID like they did? Who, th- who would have ever thought Canada would have dealt with a trucker strike like they did? So I don't know where it's headed. But when you begin to see what has happened and what is being planned by the kings of the earth. You see, it could be, it's possible 
very possible that even here in America, you know, we may be faced with martyrdom. Now, you know, I hope, this, isn't this a great Palm Sunday message? <laughs> I hope that day, day doesn't come. But we know it's going to come in the scriptures. I mean, it said, you know, Revelation deals with that. But we hope it doesn't come here. And, and I believe we need to stand against all that. You know, stand against the structure and the system that will facilitate that, which is being formed right now by the kings of the earth. And we need to stand against it in intercession and whatever other you know, peaceful measures that we can come up with or whatever the Lord may lead us to do. We need to stand against it. But at the same time, we, we have to have this attitude. This is, this is the attitude. We have to say to, to my soul life, whatever the Lord says I need to get rid of, I need to get rid of it because I want to be a part of the church at Philadelphia. And I want to be part of the man-child company. That's, that's part of it. But then we also have to make a decision. You know, I, I had did a message on this a while, not too long ago, this year, I think. Prepare the people not to deny my name. And I used Philadelphia and Sardis, where Sardis, you know, they had to overcome so that Jesus would confess their name before the Father. And Philadelphia, they did not deny his name. And so the pressure on the, on the love your life unto physical death is going to be the, the name and the truth of Christ. That's going to be the battle. You know. Are you going to hold to scriptural truth or are you going to deny that in order to save your life? Or many ways to God. You know, are you going to say, okay, there's many ways to God. You do not deny my name. Or are you going to say, no, there's one, there's one way. There's one way. There's one truth. There's one way. And it's Jesus Christ. That's the only way. Now, it's, it's easy to say it right now in this room. But if you're before whoever, it's, it's hard. But we have to, we, we, we have to, that's, the man child will, be one who did not love their life even when faced with death. And it may have meant death or it may not have meant death, but they, had made, they did not deny Christ in the midst of that. That's that man-child company. They overcame the dragon and all his strategies by the blood of the lamb, a testimony they had, they had overcome, and the fact that they did not love their soul life or their natural life even to death if necessary. Um, now, I want to be a part of that, and I've kind of, I don't know that I've totally, you know, I've been praying, that just to be, this is my kind of personal approach to this. I've been praying, Lord, I, I don't really, I mean, of course, I'm older than probably most everybody in the room, so it's a little bit easier when you get older, than when you're in the prime of your life or whatever. Um, not that I'm not in the prime of my life. Maybe physically I'm not, but spiritually. <laughs> okay, Donna, you be quiet here. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I pray, Lord, just prepare me for that. I say, you know, I, martyrdom doesn't, I mean, of course, if I'm faced with it, I'm, I'm sure I'll be have a different attitude. But right now, I feel like martyrdom doesn't bother me as much as torture preceding martyrdom. That's like, okay, uh, you know, beheading, from what I understand, is pretty quick. <laughs> so anyway, I don't want to, yeah, enough. We won't go, we won't go to... Uh, um, but we, let's pray. Let's pray that God will prepare us for all of this. You know, Amen, Amen. Okay, so that's Revelation chapter twelve, uh, and the bride made ready will be a part of this company that will be the first fruits of this. 
Now, let's go now to Revelation 19. Um, Revelation 19, 7. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the end of the age. Uh, let, me, let me read it and then we'll talk about it. Uh, let us rejoice, this is Revelation 19, verse 7. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Verse 9, Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true words of God. Uh, okay, so this, remember we, we talked about the Jewish wedding system and we were betrothed and we were born again. Okay, this is the final marriage uh, event, the actual consummation of the marriage and the marriage supper of the Lamb. And even the Greek word, I'm not going to go there, for the, the marriage, that is uh, the word that describes that second of the, of the two ceremonies. The betrothal ceremony took place when you were born again, the actual marriage ceremony with Christ and his bride will be at the end of the age. And we have, the, from the time we're born again until we die, or the church has from the time of the cross to the second coming to make itself ready. Uh, and this is the, the, so this is the culmination of the marriage ceremony that's taking place that we're talking about here. And because if you look at the very next verse, starting with verse 11, that's when the heavens open up and Jesus returns. And so, you know, what happens is the wedding takes place, the consummation takes place, and then the very next thing, the heavens open up and Jesus returns with his armies. And we'll deal with that in the next session. That's a, excite, an exciting uh uh, discussion and scripture and a uh, situation that will, or text that we'll look at. But this is the marriage, uh, the cl final marriage ceremony, uh, knowing the Greek word there of the marriage of the Lamb. It has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Her bride has made herself ready. Now, that word bride is the word um, guno. Uh, there's two Greek words for bride or wife. There's nomphe and guno. Did, guno. Am I saying that right? Guno? What is it? Guno? Guno? Uh, you're supposed to be the expert. Uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, it's right in the text. Okay, for some reason I'm saying that it doesn't sound like the right word. But anyway, there is nomphe is refers to a betrothed, uh, bride or one that is um, a young wife, a newly married type wife would be. Uh, so all the ones back there, they're new face, you know, betrothed. But gune, gune, it's not guno, it's gune. Gune is, refers both to woman, as it could be just a general word for woman, or a wife that is in a consummated marriage relationship with her husband. In other words, they're actually been through the second ceremony and they're living together as husband and wife. You know, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, where Joseph and Mary were betrothed, they were betrothed. Remember, they were betrothed and she was with child. And, the, you know, and Joseph was thinking about divorcing her. Uh, and, you know, what the, the angel said... He said, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, your gune, your gune as your wife. Uh, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. So, that, so she was betrothed, and he said, don't be afraid to consummate the marriage relationship uh, as, your, as your gune, your wife. So that word refers to a one in a consummated marriage relationship. Uh, relationship. Um, now, with Joseph and Mary, they didn't have relations uh, until after uh, Jesus was born. I want to just, just clarify that. But 
Gune, this is what I want, the point I want to make. The Greek word in Revelation 19.7, the bride has made herself ready, that's gune. That's, that Greek word is gune. In other words, the wife who will be in a who the wife who will be in a consummated marriage relationship with Christ, the eternal wife of the Lamb, the, is the gune, and it's the one who has made herself ready. Who has made herself ready? So, in other words, she was given the assignment to make herself ready uh, when she was born again. Revelation 2 and 3 and, and many other places in Scripture call the bride to make herself ready. Be ready, be ready, be ready, be ready. And the one who will be the eternal wife of the Lamb has made herself ready. It's, it's actually taken and heeded all that and made herself ready. Now, it's interesting, and this, is, this has a prophetic edge to it, I think, prophetic word to it for us. It's interesting that today is Palm Sunday. Um, and, you know, Palm Sunday, you know, it, it, I don't like the term Palm Sunday and Easter so as much as Passover and, uh, you know, res and first fruits and the, the real terms there. But, it, but anyway, on Palm, on Palm Sunday, what we celebrate is Palm Sunday, Jesus entered into Jerusalem riding on a colt. He entered in and to Hosanna and Hosanna. And, you know, taking it in the terminology of the Passover, four days before the slaughtering of the lambs, each family had to bring their lamb and had it visible for those four days to make sure it was perfect before they slaughtered it on Passover. So Jesus was living out all that. But when he came in on that, what we will call it Palm Sunday, when he came into Jerusalem on there, so you can see it in Matthew 21, and he went almost immediately to the temple and he did another cleansing of the temple, but he spent that week teaching. And it's interesting, when he spent that week teaching, you can look it up, you know, Matthew 22, and we're going to actually deal with Matthew 22 and Matthew 25 in subsequent sessions. But Matthew 22 is the, mar is the parable of the marriage supper. And they went out and all that, and he said, you know, the banquet is ready, but you are unworthy. And so they sent them out all over the place, and they brought in, the banquet hall was filled, and, but there was one that didn't have wedding clothes on. But so we'll deal with that in another session. But the point is, there was an invitation to get ready in that parable. You know, and if you look at Matthew 24, you know, talking about the end times and all that, his exhortation to his disciples was, get ready, get ready. You can see it, Matthew 24, I think it's 44, but it's right there in that Matthew 24. He said, you get ready. And then in Matthew 25, he said, Matthew 25, the parable of the ten virgins, he said, you know, all about the oil and the lamps and all that. And he said, the ones who were ready went in to the marriage supper and the others were excluded. So here he is. And when he came in on the colt, he was coming in with respect to salvation and preparation. He said, I'm giving you an invitation. Get ready. Get ready. Now, when he comes back, he says, I'm coming back with those who got ready. You can see it in Revelation 19, 7, uh, 7 through 9, and you see it in Revelation 19, 11, especially 14 and 15, because he talks about them being clothed in fine linen in 197 and 9, and who comes back with it? The armies are clothed in fine linen. Same, ter essentially, the same terminology as those who are made ready. And see, that's what he was doing. That's what he was doing to the church, to the, his people. He was saying, 
you got to, I'm betrothing you. I mean, I don't know if they knew that or not, but I think he was saying, I'm betrothing you to me when I pay the dowry at my, with my cross life and die and I'm resurrected and, you, and I've done my part. Now, when you get born again, you will be betrothed to me. But your assignment during the, your life is to make yourself ready for the wedding feast and for the marriage of the Lamb. And those who did it made themselves ready will be with him forever, will return with him and be ready forever and ever and ever. And this is this is a word, this is a word for us, I guess, too, but it's a word for the global church. This came to me, I guess it was yesterday morning. From Luke 19, 41 through 44. Now this happened, this is Luke's version, but this happened during this same week. He is in Jerusalem. He had triumphantly entered on the colt to, to Hosanna, Hosanna. And he went and he approached, it's Luke 19, 41 through 44. When he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it saying, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you on every side, and they will level you to the ground and your children within you, and they, they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. And the Lord, the Lord wept. And I, I, I really believe what the Lord is saying right now. I mean, if it applies to you, receive it. But I know it's, this is going out to a lot of people. He's weeping over the church right now. Because they're not heeding the day of their visitation. And he's given a warning even in Revelation chapter 3 to the church at Sardis, he said, wake up, because I've not found your work. It's not uh, Completed is probably not the best translation. It's satis satisfactory. I've not found you, your walk satisfactory. And then he says, if you don't wake up, I'm going to come like a thief, and you will not know the day or the hour. And so he's given an invitation now and I believe, I don't think it's a coincidence that, I mean, we don't plan that well to know that we're going to teach this on Palm Sunday with this. I think the Lord knew it. And I think there's an invitation right now. And, and Brian had the word. There's another entry point or on ramp, I think. I forgot exactly how he said it to make ourselves ready, which I, th I think pertains to us, but it pertains beyond us. So I don't want to put, I don't want to put it just on this group like we're not ready because, you know, I, I think probably every one of us or most every one of us is actively pursuing making ourselves ready. But we need to press into that issue because he's weeping over the condition of the church and, it, and those that don't heed these things are going to, be, going to be caught completely unaware and they're not going to be prepared. He's going to come like a thief to them. Now, not to us. Paul said this. Not to us <coughs> because we have understanding, but we've got to put action to our understanding. That's where we are right now because we want to be a part of this group at the end of the age that has made herself ready. She has heeded Jesus' exhortations in this last week of his ministry. She's heeded the, the Revelation chapter 2 and 3 and all the other places in Scripture that's called us to that. She's heeded these things and she will be ready. So let's, let's uh, continue on uh, Revelation 19, 7 through 9. She has made herself ready. 
and so that made herself. So there's, I, I did want to make this point. There is a personal responsibility in that. Again, it's by God's grace, by his power, but we have a personal responsibility to give attention to it. Uh, and it, okay, it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Now, let me, let me deal, I need to deal with uh, uh, given to her to clothe herself in fine linen. Now, that's, when you first read that, when I read that, I thought, okay, she's given an assignment to clothe herself in fine linen. But that's really not the meaning of that word. She has been granted and she's been given fine linen. In other words, through her life, she made herself ready. And so, at this point, Jesus puts on her fine linen because she's made herself ready. Now, there is an assignment to pursue that, but at this point in time, she has been successful, and Jesus gives her fine linen, bright and clean. Now, what is this fine linen? Um, I won't take the time to go through all. There's, there's a good bit, but it's all in the notes. In Exodus, they talk about the garment of the priest. And the priest had to wear fine linen to go into the presence of the Lord. Now, when they ministered in the outer court, they put on other, other outfits or whatever. But to go into the presence of the Lord, you see this in, in Exodus, you see it in Ezekiel, uh, the sons of Zadok, and you, you, you know, it's all in those, the references, you, you need to go and look at it. They, the fine linen had to be worn to go into the presence of the Lord. And the sons of Zadok were granted the fine linen, but the ones that uh, rebelled against them were in the outer court, had to minister in the outer court. So here's part of the preparation. The preparation to make ourselves ready as a bride will result in, if, we're, if we pursue this, and God's grace is there, it will be there if we pursue it. If we pursue it, he, at, that, at the end of the age, he will he will put fine linen on us, which is going to be necessary if we want to uh, be a priest that can minister under him. Remember Revelation 1, he created us to be kings and priests, but we need the fine linen to be that priest that can minister before in, in his presence. Bright and clean, and the brightness is, is a word for brilliant, glorious raiment, kind of a brilliant white clean and pure. Uh, he was clothed with that. And the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Now let me deal with that and then we'll close uh, after this. The righteous acts of the saints. That's really one word in the Greek, that righteous acts. That righteous acts doesn't mean how much works of service or righteousness I can do externally. There, has an, there is an aspect of deeds to it, but it's deeds led and initiated by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit empowered and initiated deeds. But basically, righteous acts of the saints, that meaning of that word is inward transformation, character transformation. And so, again, going back to Revelation chapter 2 and 3, he gave us this invitation. He said, okay, these are the issues you need to deal with. And at the end of the age, those that will be part of this bridal company dealt with those issues. Now, there are other things in the scripture, but in the context of the book of Revelation, you're given this Revelation 2 and 3 as an assignment to deal with these things, and these righteous acts of the saints are the people who successfully dealt with them. And they'll be invited to the wedding marriage supper of the Lamb. They'll be invited to the end time 
processional when Christ returns. There'll be participants in the millennial reign of Christ and the ages to come. They'll dwell in the new Jerusalem forever and ever. There'll be a pillar in the new Jerusalem. That's the, that's the goal. Christ is author, has authority to make it happen, but he's looking for a people who will say yes to it. And yes, in terms of a daily pursuit and, and allow the Holy Spirit to change you. It's not doing, listen to it, it's not doing more work. It's saying, Lord, just change me and let him do it. Do what he says do, heed it. So it's not doing more. I want to make sure we're clear on that. Because a lot of times these kind of messages get filtered in, uh, I can't do any more than I'm doing. I'm not, we're not, I don't think the Lord's asking you to do anything more. Just say, Lord, whatever you want to do, do it in me. And then cooperate with him, whatever he says. Uh, so anyway, we've dealt with this. As four, let me close with this. As forerunners, because it's a forerunner school, as forerunners, we must have great insight into these passages of Scripture because you need to be a messenger and you need to be a builder. You need to be a messenger, a friend of the bridegroom and a messenger. You need to be a messenger who can say, you need to do this. You know, this is what it's called. And that, we talked about this when we were doing some recording this week. Being a messenger is, can be a very unfun, that's probably not a word, uh, unfun thing, you, you know, because people don't like messengers a lot of times. Uh, but for those who receive it, then you can be a builder. You can help them to build these things into their life, to become this body. But I'll tell you, building to me is be, be more fun than messengering. But uh, they both are needed. Both are needed. And so as forerunners, we need to understand. But you can't be a messenger or a builder if you don't have real a grasp of what these things say. That's why it's so important. That's why I'm going into such detail about it is so that you can really get it in your heart what these things say. Uh, and you really go to, need to go to the notes because there's a lot more in the notes, a lot more detail in the notes that I couldn't get to in this. But let's, let's raise ourselves up as a bride made ready first and as forerunners in the spirit and the power of Elijah who are messengers, builders, friends of the bridegroom to prepare a way for the second coming of Christ. Amen. Amen. Lord, do it. We pray that you do it in us. Lord, we, we're in, it's impossible for us to do it, but we ask you to do it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So I guess we'll end our recording at this point in time. And uh, Amen. All right. Amen. Amen. Well, when uh, when Dad was talking, I, I when Dad was talking, I, I thought that was a, just a really well done message. Um, I just want to. I felt like we need to respond. Can we get the um, the people, all the kids and everything in? So I feel like we need to have a corporate response here. Um, so we'll wait one second for them to get in. Go ahead and stand real quick. And we want to just be in the presence of God for this. I just, I just felt like we really need to say, you know, say yes to the Lord, to this response to be made ready. Not just to hear a message and think, okay, I got it. But th this is going to be, to be made ready is going to require your entire life. It's not something you just make a decision on and just go your merry way. I mean, it, it involves restructuring everything about your life. Your whole life has to revolve around this. Um, and so I just, I just want us to take a very measured, very serious approach to this. Um, so 
just close your eyes for a second in the presence of the Lord, and we just want to wait on the Lord for a second and just say, Lord, let the Holy Spirit come and settle here in this room. I feel right now, even as I started talking, I feel the grace of God, a, a tangible sense of God's grace right now, inviting us into this new season of readiness, okay? So just, yeah, we'll let, we'll let everyone come in. Yeah. We want to get into the spirit right now. Not that we weren't, or we're not in the spirit, but. I just want to invite everyone to stand, even kids to stand as well. And if you're just getting in here, you may like, what are you even doing? So the Lord has given us a, a very clear invitation, and, and it's a prophetic, a new prophetic season God has invited us into. There is an on-ramp to readiness, and I, and I mentioned this before, but that on-ramp to readiness is if you're going down the highway and there's an off on-ramp, that means you're getting off the road you're on, off into a new exit to go a different way. So this means God is requiring us to change some things about our life. Whatever that would be, you know, is between you and the Lord. Um, but I just really want us to, what I want us to do based on Dad's past two messages, I want us to make, if this is in your heart, if this is in your heart, that yes, Lord, I want to make this call or this pursuit, this radical pursuit to make myself ready, whatever that looks like, whatever it means. But it, this is not just like a decision you make on this Sunday, April 10th, and then you go off and forget about it. I'm, this is more of a, I'm, I'm being marked for the rest of my life to be made ready. Being made ready, this pursuit of being made ready is the most important thing about your life. It's more important than being a good spouse. It's more important than being a good mother or a father. It's more important than your wife or your husband or your kids. This is, but you'll be a much better husband and wife and father and mother if you pursue this. But I just want us with our eyes closed right now. If, if you want to make this call, if you want to respond to this call, to make yourself ready. And you may not even know what it looks like. You may not know what it all involves. You may not even understand it. It doesn't matter right now. But if you want to say yes to the Lord, I want to be made ready. With your eyes closed, I want you to raise your hand. But hold on before you raise your hand. Only do it if you really mean it as, as I am going to make this the pursuit of my life, as the most important thing about my life is to be made ready as a bride for Jesus Christ. And if you're not there yet, that's okay. Don't, don't raise, I'd rather you not raise your hand than raise your hand and not mean it, just out of pressure. That's why I didn't have people come up. So if, if you want to, to be made ready, with your eye, everyone with their eyes closed, just raise your hand. If you want to make this your pursuit, your radical pursuit of your life, just raise your hand. Okay, I'm not even going to look who's raising their hands. Okay, so no one look. Okay, oh, well, she's raising her hand. He's not. He's dedicated. She's not. Okay, I'm not even looking either. God's, yeah, like God's looking. It's the Lord who's looking right now. All right. And even the scripture dad read about Jesus weeping over the city because they missed their day of visitation. That was, that was part of what the Lord spoke to me in that prophetic word when he gave us this new invitation to readiness. Pray that we don't miss our day of visitation. I've seen it way too often when God gives a prophetic invitation, how easy it is because our lives are so busy and we have so much going on and we have so many distractions and we have so many responsibilities, how easy it is to forget the prophetic word, even with good intentions. And the Lord just said, pray that you do not miss your day of visitation. And it was not, I don't think it mean like the Lord visiting in this 
revival. I think it's more the Lord visiting in this inward preparation, which could involve revival, but I think it's more related to that. So, Lord, we do say right now, Lord, we say yes to this invitation, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Being made ready as the wife of the Lamb is the most important thing about my life. Just say that right now if you mean it. Just say, say it. I'll say it, and then you repeat after me. Lord, being made ready is the most important thing about my life. Lord, being made ready is the most important thing in my life. Let's say it one more time. Lord, Lord being, being made, made ready, ready is the most important, important thing, thing about, about my, my life. life. And so, Lord, I just want to pray right now, Lord, that we would receive, just right now, the Lord, the Lord knows those who meet it in the heart. Just, I believe God, the Lord is going to release the grace of God right now. This is, even though it says the bride makes herself ready, and like Dad said, we have a responsibility, we cannot make ourselves ready. Only God can make us ready. But he, he works in cooperation with us. There's things that, that only God can do that we can't do, and there's things that God won't do that we must do. But there is a participation in this call to be made ready. But I just believe right now, just you'll receive the grace of God. He will empower you to be made ready. He will do in you what you can't do. He will enable you to be who God has called you to be, and he will, he will enable you to do what God has called you to do, what is humanly impossible. What we're talking about right now as the bride being made ready is humanly impossible. It cannot be done by the flesh. It cannot be good, done by good moral Christians who try to, to, from their own soul, obey God. This is, must be a work of the Holy Spirit that he does inwardly as you cooperate with his grace. Yes, yes. So just receive right now the grace of God. We receive right now. You can't earn grace. You can't work for grace. You can't do for grace. Grace is unearned and unmerited. You receive grace. You don't achieve grace. You receive grace. Right now, just receive. I just feel the Holy Spirit on this. Just receive right now the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that will come upon you, that is coming upon you and rising up within you to enable you to be made ready. The Lord is going to do it as you cooperate with his grace. Do it, Lord. Lord, let, we do not receive the grace of God in vain. We receive it. Because now we want to go cooperate with it, with him who gives grace, power, enablement, ability that we can't do in and of ourselves. Not by might, not by power, but by your spirit, says the Lord of hosts. The hour is late. The time is urgent. Jesus is coming like a thief in the night. And he's coming, and only those who are, being who are making themselves ready will not be shocked and will not miss him when he comes like the thief in the night. Let me say that again. Jesus said, I'm coming like a thief in the night. I'm coming like a thief in the night. And only those who are, be who are making, who are ready when he comes We'll, we'll see him when he comes. The others just, they will miss his day of visit, his, his coming as a thief. There's a lot to that. The point is, we want to be ready. So, Lord, I pray right now that you would seal this work that you, you have started. You would seal it, Lord, just like Song of Solomon 8.6. You would seal this work with your fire. Lord, that love is as strong as death and jealousy is as cruel as the grave. It's flashes or flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. The Lord says set from Song of Solomon, set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. Hear the word of the Lord. 
The Lord says, set me as a seal upon your heart. As a seal upon your arm. We do, Lord. We set you right now as a seal on our heart. Just say it to the Lord right now if you mean it. Lord, we set you as a seal upon our heart, yes. Jesus. We set you as a seal upon our seal arm. Upon our Lord, we say love is as strong as death. We say jealousy is as cruel as the grave. Yeah. It's flashes or flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Lord, would you come right now with your enabling grace, with your consuming fire, and Lord, would you burn inside of our hearts a holy passion for your name. Lord, would you burn inside of us, Lord, that passion and that fire of God that would burn by the enablement, the enablement of the Holy Spirit's oil, burning like fire that we might have bright and shining lamps here at the end of the age. Seal the work, Lord. Seal the yes in the heart. Seal it, we pray. In the name of Jesus, Lord. Amen. 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 Great message, Dad. I want to encourage everybody. If, if, read the notes.